One of my first uh, jobs was I worked on Wall Street. I was a runner, and then I got an opportunity to move over to what is called RCAC. There's two big companies, RCA and RCAC. The C is communications. And the, uh, the communications that they provide was for the whole world. It was radio. Mm -hmm. See, ra radio was getting to be a big thing, and television wasn't around. The Atlantic cable was overloaded, you know, and they needed other sources. So uh, I, I got a uh, job there uh, as a uh, routing clerk, you know, and it was great because I could stand there and I could watch faxes. That was a new thing. Faxes is the same as it is today. Faxes come over from the uh, from Europe, you know, with the with the Germans fighting in, in Poland and all that, uh, at the uh, Spanish War and all that sort of stuff. So it was a, a great experience working in a communications place like that. I was drafted. I was the first number out of the fishbowl, and it was a peaceful draft. That's the only peaceful draft the United States ever had. I got up in the morning and went to the door. My mother kissed me. And I had a little handbag, and I had a few things thrown in it, and I walked to the uh, the induction center, which was not exactly close, but it was it did for the area, and that was in New York City, uh, Springfield Gardens they call it, and I lived in St Albans. New York City has five big uh, camps around it, so I figured we'll get in the army uh, with a nickel. I get down to Times Square, and you know, get home. I was close by. They sent me all the way down to Fort Worth, Texas, Mineral Wells, a brand new camp, infantry camp down there, and uh, it was a it was a culture clash, you know, to say the least. And so uh, I couldn't wait to get out of Texas. I didn't like Texas. One day, uh, two officers came in. I know their name, R. G. Cole and uh, Captain Coots, and said, "Hey, uh, we are starting a new branch uh, called Paratroops, and we need volunteers. The only way you're going to get in is to volunteer." And uh, Lieutenant Cole said, "And you're going into a charm circle." That caught me. You got jump pay. You didn't have to do K KP. You didn't have to stand guard. That caught me. And so, uh, for some reason, I, d I didn't like to be three feet off the ground. And uh, so I volunteered, and, and, uh, and we left right away for Fort Benning. And we got off the train at Fort Benning, and they said, we're going to take you down so you can see a jump. So they were qualifying some men uh, at the Lawson Field, which was close by the barracks and looked up and here's this fella caught on the tail of the plane. He flew around some three hours before they got him down. And what the whole thing was is that they were using a, a nine foot uh, static line. Now the static line is attached to the plane, it's attached to you, it pulls your chute out. And uh, they, they hadn't made their mind how long that was going to be. But uh, the men were bunking their head on the tail and a few other things like that. And so that was the last time they used a nine-foot static line. From then on, it was 12 feet. It was assigned to a jump class and went through what they call A, B, C, and D stages. A is physical, and, and B is... Uh, uh, B stage was... Uh, uh, toughening up and knowing the techniques of jumping. And then the, uh, C was uh, uh, going to uh, the, the various uh, uh, facilities they had for jumping and actually a hands-on the chute. And then the, the last stage was, uh, was a packing your own chute called uh, rigging. And uh, we would never, I would never jump anyone else's chute. I knew my chute was packed right. I volunteered for paratroops, and uh, we were on our first uh, first uh, campaign, a uh, training campaign in uh, South Carolina, and we came back on a Saturday, and 
course we were all tired and Sunday was our day off. And I was laying in my bunk and at 12, 12.30, the announcement at Pearl Harbor Company. Now, I, it didn't register with me too much, but I was with a group of men who were regulars. I mean, they, they made, they were in the Army for their career, and uh, they knew I was in just for the year and get out, you know. And that was my plan. And when the announcement came across Pearl Harbor, they knew what was happening, and I didn't know exactly, but in about five minutes I knew I was in the Army forever. <laughs> no one was going to get out. In North Africa, uh, it was not uh, a situation where an airborne, where an airborne division uh, could uh, demonstrate what it, was, uh, what it was meant for, and that was for a certain type of combat. And so we were held in reserve until, until we got down in the final phases of, uh, of uh, wiping up uh, the uh, German Africa Corps, and they were a great army, and uh, was in on the greatest, uh, the biggest capture of, uh, of uh, the American army. We captured our uh, some quarter of a million men. Germans, the English were coming from the uh, from the east, and uh, the Allies had the job of coming from the west, from the Atlantic Ocean, and they, we caught them in the middle, and they they just gave up. It. They were out of supplies, out of ammunition. They were out of men, out of everything. So the uh, supplies had a big, uh, the American supply of the war uh, had a big effect there. We flew from uh, Kerouan, Africa, which is just outside of uh, Tunis, and uh, we flew uh, towards Sicily. Sicily was our uh, objective. All this was planned ahead of time. That, that is, uh, uh, Stalin and uh, Churchill and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, our president, said this is the way it's going to happen. So when Africa fell, Sicily was the next objective, mostly because of the nearness and could support a war on the mainland of Europe. See, we were on that island. So they planned this, uh, this jump uh, uh, at Jela, Sicily, and uh, we took off. It was only about, I would say, just a little over an hour in the air. And as we were coming in, you got to realize that in parachuting, you, keep, you don't jump high because if I jump, if we jump at 12, even 1,200 feet, the man in front of you may, be, may have landed a mile away from you. So we flew low, I would say 650 feet. And that, that's not very high, particularly if you have a problem uh, to correct for it. And so we, we were coming in to uh, our uh, uh, drop zone uh, in Sicily, and we were offshore. And just before we we uh, got there, the Germans uh, Stukas had a bombing raid, and we biggest mistake, and they never did it again. We flew over our own navy, so the navy thought they were firing at the German aircraft. And we came in at 600 feet when you can't miss anything at 600 feet, and flew right over them. And they start, they opened up. So in war, when once one gun opens up, another gun starts going. It's a, it's a, a natural thing. So the uh, the navy shot at us with all their fire, firepower. It was a big navy too, and we hit the uh, beachhead, and. Uh, the Germans started firing at us, and our own troops started firing at us. And so we passed over the Germans, our troops, I mean the, the Navy, our troops, and the Germans, and uh, all, all were shooting at us. And we had 123 planes, and we lost 23 planes, packed with paratroopers, my friends. And uh, then, of course, the pilots could do nothing but scatter. So we ended up going every which way. They would fly between the flak, you know, the flak that's like fireworks coming up, 
and they would, you know, fly. And uh, I was I was the lead jump master of the second battalion. And uh, uh, my, as we were going, and I had my men stand up and hook up, because uh, we were on fire. Our wing, uh, right wing, was on fire, and uh, the the uh, crew, the crew chief came to me and said, "The pilot wants to see you." So I went back and saw. I went up and saw him and looked out in front, and it was, you know, it wasn't encouraging with all the action going on. He says, what are we going to do? I said, you find a jump field. You find what you think. See, this isn't night. This is two o'clock, uh, between 12 and 2 o'clock at night. He uh, And uh, I said, you just find a field. And when that light turns green, we're out of here. And which is a kind of a, 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 a situation that arises. See, you have all these fellas, 26 fellas standing up. And in three seconds to nine seconds, they're all out. And that throws the tail of the plane up. And he, he has to know how to navigate. So I, I came back and I had the men stand up and went through our check. And in other words, they always check the man in front of you, see that everything's all right. Because getting out of the plane is an important thing. If you don't get out right, you, you may lose your life. So uh, uh, I had him stand up. And the, the crew chief says, hey, what are we going to do with the general? And all the time I was in that plane, and of course I was busy with the men and so forth, there's the assistant division commander sitting in, in the back, as far back in the plane as you can get. And he had a parachute, but it wasn't our parachute. It was a regular uh, Air Corps chute. And I went to him, I said, General, we're we're going to crash if you don't get out, and we're going to go as soon as, I gave him the message, we're going to go as soon as the pilot says go. So I told the pilot to slow down to, a, to about 100 miles an hour, because that was important. Uh, you can't, uh, you can jump at any speed, but it, it, it just uh, is not the perfect way to jump. It's about 110 miles an hour is the max. So just uh, just then, as I was talking to the general and trying to get, a, I, he was General Kearns, Assistant Division Commander, 82nd Airborne. And uh, as I was talking, then the the, uh, the the flight sergeant came up and said, "The green light's on." And I just turned around. I said, "Let's go!" And we just went out the door, and uh, we landed very close to a German tank park. But I was on the outside. I think some of my stick landed in because they they were missing an action. Uh, the uh, part of the uh, crew that jumped with me, and we landed in a nice soft tomato field, which was a uh, if you ever want to jump, you want to jump in the tomato field. <laughs> But uh, then uh, didn't know what to do. But we could. Uh, I knew where the fighting was because south of me was all these flashes and boom, boom, boom. I, so the the boys I uh, I gathered up about four of them. He said, "What are we going to do?" I said, "That's where we're going. You know, that's where the noise is. There's no other place." We had a we had a a, uh, a mission, but uh, I didn't know where we were. If if you if you're taken to your drop zone by the plane, then you know where you are. So we just uh, that night, at, at the moon was you could read a paper it was, uh, and I saw this farmhouse, and I went up to it and I knocked on it, and this old gentleman answered and spoke perfect English to me. He had been in Brooklyn, he had retired, and now he's back living. That's all. He, that's what Italians did. Uh, the Immigrants did, uh, they made, came or made their fortune in the United States and went back home. And so he oriented me uh, to where I was and uh, we took off for, the, for the, the, uh, the noise. And we walked a couple hours and uh, finally came upon another group of men. I had an experience with a German tank and uh, we didn't have we didn't have a weapon to fight a tank, so we just avoided it. 
And uh, next thing you know, uh, we started to gather the, the uh, people. But while I was there, standing in the door, I saw three of our planes loaded with 26 parachutes crash and a big ball of fire. And they were, you know, you knew all of them. So we, we did uh, uh, gather at the, uh, at the uh, DZ and uh, then uh, waited for uh, someone with, uh, with rank to take over. <laughs> as, you, as you reported, what's your rank? What's your date of rank, you know? In other words, uh, uh, the fellow who was, had the highest rank was a little bit worried. He wanted someone higher than him to come in, so it would be his responsibility. But that's all we did. We, we collected ourselves there and we pulled together, we pulled together, in our battalion we pulled together about 130 men out of 500. And then we started receiving orders, get on the road, go, go west, and that's what we did. There was an airfield we went and took, the, no opposition whatsoever. It, it was a day-by-day -day thing after then, after that. We, the Italian army, that, that's who was defending Sicily. And of course, there were Germans there, and they and they had the first, the the first Tiger tank, and I, I saw those tanks, and we couldn't do anything. Even our bazookas could had no effect on them. They had tracks. That is the, uh, what they travel on. They had tracks thirty six inches wide, tremendous things. Herman Goring, uh, tank uh, tank division. So we kept going and taking airfields, and there wasn't a good feeling between the English and the Americans. We had General Patton with the Seventh Army. I was, our 82nd was part of the 82nd Airborne Division was part of the uh, the Seventh Army. Uh, I was in the 504 Parachute Regiment at the Second Battalion. And my commander was, uh, uh, commanding officer was uh, William, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, William Yarborough. Now Yarborough designed the wings of the parachutes. He, he was a, he was a, uh, a pioneer for parachutes. And uh, he designed these wings. In three days he went up to Washington and, and drew up these wings and they be, they've been the parachute wings ever since. Well, I was his S1, S2. In those days, in the Airborne, you were the adjutant and the intelligence officer. So uh, we were given the, the, uh, the British just didn't, uh, the experiences that the, the British had with the Americans in, in uh, Africa were not good because the Americans were not good. Uh, as they put it, and the main reason they said the Americans do not have the stomach for fighting. Well, why should we? Uh, uh, we were pulled into the war to help out. Uh, but, and so it wasn't our war, really. And we wanted to be home by Christmas. So that was a big thing, home by Christmas. And those British had been there for three years which was another big thing. But uh, uh, they weren't that good either, and we, we were worse. We weren't equipped right. Uh, I mean, you figure, well, uh, we're in Africa. You're going to be hot there, so they'll give you summer uniforms. You'll freeze to death at night. Uh, and uh, it's cold in Africa. It, I mean, Africa's not a warm place. It's cold, very cold. And so the, a lot of things like that. We didn't have the equipment. And of course, parachutes don't have anti-tank uh, equipment. And so there's limitations to what? We're a hit, hold, and be relieved. In other words, we go ahead uh, without any support. We take our objective, and the army is supposed to catch up and take over. But we secure it for them so that it's a bridge. You know, make sure the bridge is there when they get there. And then occasion we would be uh, go after a, a special target like a communication center, wipe it out. If you take out their communications, they can't do much. We were at uh, Anzio up in Anzio. We had in in a hundred days plus 
we had uh, 27,000 casualties. And the killer on the whole thing, and I still don't understand it, but it's put in many places, our non-combat injuries was 44,000 in, uh, that is, you know, uh, diarrhea, uh, uh, frostbite, uh, uh, dysentery, all like that. So that was really tough, but the thing was, we, we went in there, the idea was to get behind Casino, and I know you don't know what I'm talking about, but there was the Gustave line where the Germans kept retreating, retreating, and that deliberately, we could never really catch up with them, but they had planned that when they got to the Gustav line at Casino, where the Abbey is on, the, on top of that one uh, mountain there, that that was where they were going to establish a winter line and stop us. And of course, we tried to go through and wage war at winter, which is not a very good idea, but if you can do it, you can do it. Well, it became a stalemate. In a very short time, they had 100,000 casualties in there, which means a lot of dead. And we, we weren't, uh, we didn't have uh, the, uh, the manpower we needed to be. The, and the British were on the other side, or the east side of the, uh, the boot. There was a mountain in between us, which was a natural uh, defense. And uh, so we were there by ourselves uh, trying to get up what is called the Lyra, L-I-R-A, valley. And the Germans had it really fortified. So the idea, well, uh, when we got up to Casino, the, the 82nd Airborne uh, uh, mission was over. In fact, the 82nd Airborne mission was over in Naples, and they kept our regiment, the 504th Infantry Regiment, as a special favor to General Mark Clark of the 6th Army, who was in charge of the, uh, the uh, Italian boot operation. And uh, uh, he really had to uh, fight for, uh, really for every uh, soldier he could get. So we asked for the 504 Regiment. We had a pretty good record. We did a lot of things. We saved Salerno. We jumped in a gap where there was no, no uh, friendly or no uh, enemy troops, just a gap. And it was a question who was going to close it and at night. It's, it's a book. They jumped at midnight, and I'm mentioned in it. But uh, uh, we jumped in the gap and saved, and saved uh, Salerno. So we got a pretty good name uh, as a regiment. So we got up to, to Naples. They pulled the whole division back except us. And we went on fighting in the mountains and then got up to the casino. They pulled us out and then they dreamt this, uh, well, it was Churchill whose uh, idea it was to uh, jump in back of the Germans. Now, if you jump in back of an enemy, you, you force him to retreat. You know, you don't, you don't want anyone fighting in front and in the back of you. So. Uh, uh, the idea was that we were going to pull reserves out of the Lear Valley, German reserves, and uh, uh, either that or cut their supply line, and they're not going to live long without a supply line. But it didn't work out that way. Uh, we landed, we were supposed to jump, the, uh, the 504 was supposed to jump on uh, uh, the Alban Hills. Now, the Alban Hills had this one highway that went from Rome down to the Lear Valley. So that was their supply route, and we were supposed to jump on it. And the last minute, they, they thought it wise not to. So we went in on the assault wave uh, on, on the beach. I have pictures of that. I went in uh, on the assault wave on the beach and took the beach. We could have, well, we did practically, not me personally, but. The, uh, the troops that were on the shore, uh, on the Mediterranean shoreline, it went right down, and, you know, within a thousand yards of Rome, and there were Germans running, you know, doing what they wanted to do, not even knowing we were there. 
It was a complete surprise. Whenever we jumped, we surprised the Germans, like at Jela and, and Salerno and, and now up at uh, uh, Anzio. So there was some hesitation, and they, they still argue about today that the uh, commanding general of the uh, Second Corps was supposed to had the decision to make to whether to go on across 40 miles of ground and uh, and go go up to Rome if possible, you know. And he decided not to. While he was deciding, about 10 days, we only had three divisions. The beachhead could only support three divisions. It wasn't big enough for anything else. And we had some British there too, and they were great. And uh, so by the time we decided to move out, or we're go well, we did, we did. We went into the attack one night, and uh, uh, we got pushed back because of minefields. But in that space of 10 to 12 days, the Germans had pulled down from Europe uh, some 12 divisions against three. So they had us coal. So for the period from, uh, from January uh, 20th until oh, May 1st, um, the, uh, it was a stalemate. And uh, we, we uh, were that effective that we're, they decided not, not to uh, try to uh, push us in the water. There were no boats to take us back anyway. All the boats were in England getting ready for the Operation Overlord, which was the D-Day. So uh, things got quiet, but uh, it became an artillery war. And in in a area half as large as our perimeter around Atlanta, uh, that's where we... All you had to do was throw a throw a bullet in the air, you'd hit something. And of course, uh, the Germans did do that, and they did uh, inflict uh, injuries. In fact, we had, it was so open that if you were wounded, you had to walk to the hospital. There was no ambulance, there was no, you had to get there the best you could, or they, you know, they, it, with the medics sometimes, but once they got there, the next day or next night, they were back. They said that things were worse there in the back on the shore of the Mediterranean than it was in the front lines. It, that's how bad it was. But uh, the, uh, the uh, casualties were high. And we had companies, uh, we're infantry, we had line companies, you know, at 25 to 30. But each one had a machine gun. So we had firepower, and we were on, luckily we were on the Mussolini Canal, which was sort of an, a natural defense. And so that went on until they, they put on an attack on February the 15th, right in front of 504. And uh, we stopped them there, but it was through artillery. When you can, th you think about 3,000 guns about 3,000 guns shooting at one place. Montgomery used this in Africa to defeat the Germans. That's, that's why he was so effective. He, he created this, what they call, massing fire. In other words, all your weapons on one target. And it was very effective, and we stopped them cold. Uh, one, the 15th of February, I can remember, and I don't know if this has ever happened uh, in the war, again, but they, they went in the attack. We listened to Berlin Gertie. Berlin Gertie was a, a radio announcer and was for, on a, a wavelength that, you know, that we could listen to it and, and of course their men could listen to it also. But she was a war criminal. Uh, in fact, uh, Tokyo Rose just died uh, very shortly, uh, just in the past month or so. But she was in the Pacific, and uh, Berlin Gertie, would, but she just said, Hitler has given the order that the beach has is going to be pushed into the sea. There was no boats to take us anyway. But those artillery, the, it was an artillery war, 
and uh, we stopped them. And about, they, they, they came right at dawn. And what had happened is during the night, the, their sharpshooters uh, came closer to us and dug right in front of us, I mean, within 100 yards, dug their foxhole and were waiting for the light. So when the light came, they would pin down all our, our positions. Well, when the artillery opened up, it, it, you just couldn't imagine the, the noise and how many shells were there. In that period, from January to uh, May, the Allies used 96 million rounds of 30 caliber. It used, I think, a million and a half shells. Sometimes these these cannons would fire until they, the barrels started uh, getting hot. I mean, you could see it at night. It became a... So when they mass their fire, nothing gets through. But all of a sudden, the Germans put up a white flag and waved it, and they made sure that we weren't going to fire. In other words, the commander, our uh, captain up there, his name was Roe, R-O-E. Uh, he told the men to cease fire, and now came uh, an a ambulances and flag, uh, at the flags, and doctors and medics and so forth, and started picking up the wounded, dead, and everything else. They, our men, went out to them, and sat on the edge of their foxhole, and to trade his candy and cigarettes. I mean, it, 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 that, that, it, it's, it, there's something there, you know. They, I, uh, I feel that, that the German soldiers didn't see any reason to kill people, but they had orders. See, what makes an army is discipline. And the better the discipline, the better your army, and that's why the German army was better than most armies, is that they had discipline. If you can't discipline your men, you can't win wars. And that's all there is to it. So uh, they uh, they came out and they, they uh, cleaned up and took all back their dead. And then from that point on, it, it got uh, the war got a lot a lot softer. We were prisoners, is what we were. We were the biggest prison prison camp of the war. <laughs> they, they had us there, but it cost them it cost them up to twelve to seventeen divisions to keep us there. And so, uh, uh, Casino never fell in, in, in that uh, period. And finally, there was a breakthrough down at the Augusta Line at Casino, which was oh, some 50, 60 miles south of where we were. And uh, then the push for Rome was on, and it went into Rome and was very it was uh, not a, a combat situation. They, they respected the city for spiritual reasons or something. And so, uh, it, it, but here, here is the kicker. I had been, uh, 504th had been relieved and we were down, uh, we, uh, uh, it was the first rotation. In other words, uh, to uh, re uh, rest people and uh, of course, being in the line all the time. Anzio was fighting 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in a foxhole that, that we used to call it our boats. Because it, it, you just dug in, uh, it was the worst time of the year, the rainy season. And you, you, you didn't have to dig too far down in, in the, the, the turf. And you could dig real well uh, because it was all uh, reclaimed land. They brought the best soil in the world up from Ethiopia and, and made farms out of and that sort of thing. But uh, when you de dug, you were in water. That's why we had those 44,000 non-combat uh, uh, injuries. But uh, uh, we were re relieved and we went uh, back to Naples, and then I went on rotation, came back to Fort Benning here in Columbus, Georgia. This was in 19, uh, 
44. And uh, here's the remarkable thing. No one ever knew that, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that, but uh, it was the same day we took Rome that the D-Day overlord started, so they never, you know, they didn't even know, and Rome, Rome wasn't a big thing, but D-Day took over, and our unit was already back, the 504th Infantry was already back, but uh, they were so chewed up that uh, they didn't go in at all. Didn't go in into Holland. I was at Fort Benning on VJ Day, and uh, it was, it was uh, you know, it's over, and everyone's happy. And uh, of course, it, it's the big cities, you know, the civilian cities that, are, that got a big kick out of that. The sailor on Life magazine kissing the girl, you know, that tip. But it was good. It meant, you know, it, 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 to me it was decision time because uh, here I am now, I'm S3 of the, of the 2nd Battalion of uh, 504, and uh, I, like, I, like, uh, I like the Army. I, I, I was a good soldier and I liked it. It's something that fitted my personality, to, uh, and uh, so uh, it was decision time. And uh, I had a little time there to think about it and decided not, not to uh, stay in the Army and go back to New York City. I had returned my family from Fort Benning to New York City because I was going to go to Staff Command School. And then from Staff Command School in Kansas, I, let, I think it was Leavenworth, uh, I was to uh, join an airborne division in the Pacific and wipe out the Japs. And uh, so when that hit, when, when the VJ Day hit, you never saw an army close, shut down so fast. You, I, I got mad because here I've been in the army. The average draftee was in the army for 30 months, 33 months. I was in for five years. And that's a big chunk out of a person's life. So, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I, uh, the law said, hey, Liberty Mutual, Rockefeller Center, you've got to take uh, Lou Fern back. It's the law. So I did, and they gave me a nice job there in the underwriting department. And uh, uh, then I started be interested in, in going back to school. I knew one thing, uh, education is great. I mean, but here it is, you know, I'm about 28 now, you know, and uh, it's not easy. And I live in St. Albans, which is not exactly the middle, it's the borough of Queens. And uh, it's not exactly close to City College, which is out down at 23rd Street and Lexington Avenue. But I put up with it and I, I as a, uh, Time went on. When we got to Naples, they pulled the division out and left 504 up there. By the way, 504 was a good, a good outfit. It was one of the best. Winston Churchill, in his memoirs, his 6,000 words that he wrote, he never mentions a unit less than a uh, division. He mentioned 504 six times. Everyone, really, in the Allied offices, everyone wanted to know what 504 was doing. And we were that good. We, our commanding officer, Colonel Reuben Tucker, was a good leader. We had good officers. When I used to go out on patrol, the officers were out, out in front. Uh, and we took care of our men. And uh, recent, uh, not recently, how many years? Oh, some three years ago, I, I was up at Fort Benning and at the, uh, Fort Bragg at a uh, 504 reunion. It was, it was called uh, All Airborne Day. And all units came there in the hotel up there and had a great time. In the early days, you, you, there's a gang of fellas you all knew and you fought with them and so on. But as time went on, you know, it, it dwindled. But 
uh, up at the Fort Bragg there, uh, uh, the, uh, the units had their lunch, a special lunch, in which they gave out awards. We had an association, the 504 Parachute Association. And uh, uh, there was a general there, and he says, I'm going to ask Captain Lou Fern to come up and give this award, you know, just sort of an honor. And uh, then he mentioned, you know, my experience, and so S3 of, uh, of the 2nd Battalion, which is operations officer. And uh, I went up there, and uh, as I was standing there, I get a tap on the shoulder, and this is a thrill to me. Uh, I get a tap on the shoulder, and I, I don't, I recognize the general because of his stars. And I think he had three stars. His name is Jack Nix, N-I-X. He lives, or did live, in Tucker. Amazing, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he says, are you Lou Fern? I said, I sure am. He says, you know what? He says, I wrote about you. You know, I, he said he went to Army school. He went to Army school, and they had to pick a project. And they picked a, he picked a project of, you know, why and how did uh, the troops at Anzio uh, fend off such odds and keep the, keep the Germans at bay. And he said, he said, you were one of the characters that he, he researched, I mean, went back through my records and everything. And he said, and this is a thrill. In fact, after he mentioned it once, I said, "Will you don't move?" And I went and got Marion. I said, "I want my wife to. Hear. <laughs> I want my wife to hear this." He says, "They uh, surmise, or he he uh, concluded that uh, that the reason why the soldiers at Anjo were so good, and they." They uh, dug deep into our backgrounds from the first day we were in the Army until then, and they found out it was because of our age, being the young. Uh, it was because uh, we started from the bottom, private, and here I, I'm, I'm a captain. I could have been major uh, if I'd stayed in, but uh, from private to captain, you know, but there were other fellows in the same book that, you know, out of about, I got a big picture in there to show you uh, uh, how many authors are in, the, in a regiment. And when, when you come down to about 30 left, you know. Uh, so it was, he said he found out, one, that they started off as privates and just worked their way on up, you know, gradually until uh, they became officers and then, uh, uh, had the Anzio experience. That was a thrill to me. Now, you know, out of the cloud, out of the sky, just dropped in my lap. So, uh, and I called Marion. I said, "Will you say that again?" <laughs> and I had Marion listen to it, and uh, and that that was a thrill. I mentioned that we got up to Naples, and then the division, 82nd Air, would put on boats. We all thought we were going back. They said, nope, 504, you're staying here. Mark Clark wanted it, and he went through General Marshall in Washington and got in a lot of trouble to get the 504. He just wanted it for that type of operation as you can get from paratroops, the purpose of them. So uh, they put us up in the mountains. And what we would do, the, the Germans were not, defending. They were sort of uh, uh, being made to be pushed out of their positions and, and retreat. Well, when we got in top of the mountain, we weren't mountain fight. I went to mountain school five, uh, five, six days up there because I was an operations officer and just to get a feel for it, you know. It was quite an experience. But I'm on top of this mountain and uh, it's, it's raining and blustering and in comes the mail. And my mother had a fruit cake there, and she knew I loved her. It did much different these fruit cakes. To, <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I shared it with the fellas, and the wind was so bad it blew the tent down. 
and there was a letter from my father. So he's, you know, he's telling me the story, uh, you know, what he's doing. He's with the Manhattan Project. I said, well, that's, you know, to myself, I said, that's good. He's home with uh, his, uh, with my mother, and and they're, they're, you know, waiting out the war. And I didn't know it either, but uh, he says, I am working with uh, Leslie Groves. Now, Leslie Groves built the Pentagon, which is the biggest office building in the world. And he is down in Oak Ridge on the Atom Smasher, which is the biggest, bigger than the Pentagon. And he was building both. That was a thrill to me. I, I I don't I didn't know that until afterwards. You know that the buildings. But he was uh, he was um, uh, on a talking basis, a first name basis with General Groves, who was in charge of Oak Ridge. And uh, so he would tell the general about me. And so he says, "Keep writing about yourself." I got the general interested. <laughs> When I went in the army, I was a private. The next thing, I'm, I'm a, a, a communications uh, uh, sergeant, and of all people, General Gavin sent me to OCS, OCS 32 down in Fort Benning, infantry officer. And uh, so uh, I became uh, an, an officer. Anyone going into a service school, and I don't care, it's Air Corps, uh, Army, Navy, whatever. The first principle is, and I guess you you can uh, you you'll know this, is to make you a gentleman. Then they make you an officer and an engineer. I came out of the army, and uh, I went back to work at Rockefeller Center with Liberty News. Now I'm a a manager. Before I was a clerk, and I come back five years later, I'm the manager because, well, I have a nice record. So I decided I have to go back to school, but I this time I'm thinking of the University of Columbia, Columbia University, which is the, one of the top schools, and that's right on Fifth Avenue, and Rockville Center is practically on Fifth Avenue, only about 50 blocks away. So I went down there one day uh, because I wanted to uh, find out about registering and who was in the, who was in the uh, auditorium speaking to the incoming class, but General uh, Dwight Eisenhower. He is now president of Columbia. So he's speaking to the incoming class. And uh, he, he, was, he impressed me. I knew him. I knew him, and I had some rub-ins with him uh, in Africa and so forth, and I, I knew him. He says, if you are, and you guys listen, if you are looking for a vocation, he says, go for the highest. He says, the highest thing you can be is a man of the cloth, a rabbi, a priest, a minister, whatever. That is, take care of man's spirit. That is the most important part of you, is your spirit. He says, now, not everyone wants to do that. If you can't be that, then be a doctor. Take care of the man's body. Heal his body. Take care of it. And if you don't want to be those two, then uh, number three would be, be a teacher. Take care of his intellect. And that wraps up man right there. One, two, or three. He says the rest, you can do what you want. You know the four freedoms, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of, uh, what is it, speech, worship, uh, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. That's freedom.